Um, our first item is adoption of the minutes from February 7th. I direct members' attention to the minutes. Are there any corrections? Seeing none, the uh, minutes are approved as presented. The first bill today is Senate File 1139, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, pleased to bring you today Senate File 1139, uh, which deals with our animal shelters and um, basically creating a situation where there's a sales tax exemption uh, for them in terms of their pets and uh, pet supplies. Would you like to move your amendment? And I, first? And I would also have, um, I have the A2 amendment. However, Madam Chair, I think that there needs to be some discussion around that amendment. Okay. And I would prefer to discuss the underlying bill first and then move to the amendment, if that would be okay. That, um, that's <clears throat> just fine. We still will regard it as an author's amendment. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Go ahead. And, and uh, I have uh, with me today, uh, well, there are, there are five testifiers. Uh, they are listed on the agenda. And uh, the bill was originally, I was originally requested by Ms. Vicki Beckendorf of Oden, Minnesota on this bill. This bill has been in front of a Senate Tax Committee before. It was carried by uh, former Senator Rosen last year. And uh, as it states, this, uh, the pets and pet supplies for nonprofit animal shelters uh, would receive a sales tax exemption. And uh, it would also provide a sales tax exemption uh, related to uh, sales and purchases with the exceptions that are listed in, uh, in the bill and also in the uh, Senate Council research analysis. And, um, and so without further ado, I know we have five testif testifiers, Madam Chair, and uh, I would certainly, I would turn the uh, microphone over to them. Um, um, certainly, Senator um, Weber, and um, I wonder, could, could you just briefly describe the, the provisions in here? It's not just the sale that's exempt, it's other things as well. That is correct, Madam is that, Chair. Is that true in your... In your amendment, too, I just want to make sure we're looking at the right language. The um, the basic uh, exemption here uh, is for pets, companion animals, and service animals, uh, as those terms are defined under current law. Uh, supplies, materials, and equipment used directly in the breeding or sheltering of care for uh, a pet, companion animal, or service animal. Uh, it does not apply to, for example, construction materials in the construction of a shelter or anything like that. And, and then it uh, also applies to purchases made by animal shelters used directly in rescuing, sheltering, and finding homes for unwanted animals. And, um, and so uh, it also uncovers um, fundraising activities that these organizations may hold and, and would not, uh, would not, it would exempt the proceeds from that from sales tax as well. And uh, so these fundraising events, uh, there's, must be conducted on premises leased for five or fewer days and, uh, and also has some uh, applications where it does not apply to as well. Okay. <clears throat> um. Senator Weber will welcome your, your uh, testifiers then. Very good. I think first on our list is uh, Karen Folkers, president of the Martin County Humane Society. And she is testifying um, uh, by Zoom. Yes, they all will be, as I understand, Madam Chair. Okay. Ms. Folkers, are you there? I am. Can you hear me? Are you, uh, yes, oh, okay. we can. yes, we can, Ms. Folkers. Uh, welcome to the committee. If you'd identify yourself for the record, um, we is. will welcome your testimony. Thank you. My name is Karen Folkers. I'm president of the Martin County Humane Society, and I thank you for letting me speak today. As you may have guessed, I'm here in support of the bill. Martin County Humane Society is a county impound and also 
take surrendered animals from the public when we have space. I'd like to address a concern that was raised in one of the past discussions when this bill was previously discussed. And that was that not charging sales tax to shelter adoptions is unfair to breeders. One speaker compared fees for shelter animals versus animals from breeders to selling used cars versus new cars. No one would expect sales tax to only be charged on the new cars and not on the, set, on the used cars. While this analogy seems fair to start with at face value, if you consider the pre-owned car to the pre-owned animal, there is a difference. No car dealer who wants to stay in business would accept a car that would cost more to repair than if what they can sell it for. Animal shelters do with the many animals that are in their care. Yes, we occasionally get an animal that is adoption ready, vetted, uh, healthy, but this is rare. More commonly, the used animals that enter the shelter have no vet care, or at least none that can be proven. The cost for readying them for adoption is often about the same as their adoption fee. Increasing the adoption fee by adding the sales tax would keep them at the shelter longer and increase the cost for their care with food and cat litter and fun things like that. If these were the only situations we faced, then used versus new car tax comparison still might be fair. Unfortunately, we also get the dead dog found on the side of the road that the public calls us about. We go to the take it to the vet, have it cremated, which isn't free. And then so far we haven't found a market for that dead dog. The litter of kittens that seem fine for the first six weeks of their life, but then developed issues with their digestive tract. Well, vet felt it was congenital. So we kept going thinking they might outgrow it. But after many days at the vet, expensive foods to try to help the situation, and also um, doing enemas more than any animal should ever have to suffer with, they crashed for good and had to be euthanized. These were new cars, not used, but still not marketable even after the cost of trying to fix all those recall items. Marshall, a little black and white kitten hit by a car, leg was broken in four spots, had to be amputated. He is sweet, playful, friendly, and very adoptable, he actually has a home waiting for him. Why are they waiting? Well, because unfortunately Marshall and about the 14 or so other cats that he is in the same room with were exposed to ringworm and are being treated for those four weeks with medication to help prevent ringworm and also to prevent it from being spread. His adoption fee will certainly not cover his medical bills. We also have that cost of extra food and cat litter and having to keep them quarantined for four weeks. By this point, the used car salesman would be out of business. The used versus new car comparison and the flaw in that actually highlights why it's responsible, or why it's, excuse me, reasonable to not tax shelter adoptions and still tax other animal sales. Breeders have control over their intake and production of animals. Certainly they still have problems, but they at least have control. Animal shelters, especially impounds, don't have that kind of control. Any stray animal from your area, you are responsible for. Even the surrendered animals often come in with health problems that are not revealed. Adding the tax to the cost of the adoption fee increases the cost of the adopter and slows the rate of the adoption. That then increases the cost of care of the animal. Removing the sales tax on nonprofit animal groups would help reduce the burden on caring for society's homeless pets. That is our life's mission for many of us and very important to us, but we feel that having the government's help of not taxing us would be a great boon. Thank you for your attention today. <clears throat> uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Folkers. Next is uh, Sue Leach. Uh, Wallaton County Humane Society. Miss um, <clears throat> Leach, are you with us? She's also a, um, test requested to testify remotely. Uh, next is Susie Kroon. Are you with us? I am. Um, 
welcome to the committee. Identify yourself, please, for the record, and um, pleased to hear your testimony. Thank you. I'm Susan Kroon. I'm president. Of, I was president of the board of benches for 17 years. I'm grateful to committee chair Ann Rest for this opportunity, and I'd like to thank Bill Weber and Senator Nick Frentz for co-authorizing this, authoring this important bill. <clears throat> I've been immersed in animal welfare work as a full-time volunteer for more than 18 years in Southern Minnesota. I appreciate the time we shared today to give you some insights into the shelter world. Most Southern Minnesota shelters are small operations. They're typically staffed by volunteers or a few paid staff and supported by volunteer help. A paid volunteer at a nonprofit is going to make much less per day than if they were in a for-profit business. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shelters take animals that are unwanted. They're abandoned strays that were an impound, animals that are turned over to us due to a change in life circumstance, like grandma going to the nursing home or death in the family or divorce. These are homeless pets. They find safety at a shelter or they're put to sleep. The goal of the shelter is to get them into a loving home. <clears throat> immediately they need to be prepared for adoption. This starts with vaccinations, blood tests, flea protection, warmer, and almost always a spay or neuter surgery. These are out-of-pocket expenses that will accumulate to twice the amount of an adoption fee collected typically. The young cat that arrives in a shelter and is tested, wormed, vaccinated, and altered surgically and remains healthy is a cost to the shelter of $200 to $250. If an adoption fee of $100 to $140 is collected, that would be very common. This is the reality of adoptions. Medical expenses are twice the amount of the adoption fee. Board of Shelters are constantly fundraising to make up that difference, that discrepancy in dollars. Our donors are generous, but they expect their donation to go to the care of the animals we are rescuing, and they're shocked to learn we have to pay sales tax and are burdened with the task of tracking and paying this to the state. All shelters remain competitive in pricing with other shelters to ensure our animals are not passed over because the fee was too high. Rescue animals are not like pets from breeders. An eight-week-old puppy in a breeder's care has no past. They have the love of their mother, and the breeder. Every cat and dog that is adopted from a shelter has a past. Often the adopting family that's willing to take the animal into their home has no idea of what that past is and the impact it'll have on their family life. We respectfully ask you to pass this bill and allow shelters to work without the burden of sales tax. Thank you so much for your time and attention. <clears throat> Um, thank you, Ms. Kroon. Uh, next, we have uh, Vicki Beckendorf from Odin, Minnesota. Are you with us? <clears throat> yes, good morning. This is Vicki Beckendorf. Okay, thank you very much. You've identified yourself. Please proceed with your testimony. Thank you for the chance to speak on behalf of Shelter Pets, especially to Representative Olson for authoring the bill. Senators Weber and Friends for supporting it and the tax committee for the hearing. I live on an acreage in Southwest Minnesota and have been adopting <laughs> rescue pets since 1986. They come from rescues and shelters in Jackson, Martin, Watanwan and Cottonwood counties. Shelters range from a network of foster homes to former pounds to built facilities and provide a service to the communities where they exist by housing animals who would otherwise roam the streets. Most of my pets' financial burden when I adopted them was on the shelters from where they came. Shelters rely heavily on fundraising to cover their costs and use mostly volunteers for staff, at least in rural areas. Saturday's Star Tribune reported the Animal Humane Society caring for 56 animals rescued in Morrison County from an unsanitary and crowded situation. 20 dogs, 32 cats, two rats, and two geckos. Some had skin and respiratory infections. That kind of rescue does not come without significant cost. Shelters do not offer pets for sale, so why is there a sales tax on them? The adoption fee, frequently reduced or waived, is small compared to what a shelter invests. If pets were offered for sale, the price would have to be much higher to cover the bills. 
veterinarians often discount services to reduce a shelter's cost when treating animals, there would be no incentive for them to do so if these pets were offered for sale at a profit. Breeders who are against eliminating the sales tax on rescue pets say doing so would be the equivalent of a subsidy, thus harming their income. But I don't think people who want a purebred dog go to a shelter to find them. In the years before shelters started collecting tax, was it hurting sales of purebred dogs? Did breeders then see an increase in sales once the tax started getting collected a few years ago? The two types of dogs, bred and rescued, and their situations are not comparable. There is a big difference between offering a breeder's puppy for sale at $300 to $3,800, essentially selling specific characteristics of a breed for profit and the Heinz 57 dogs typically found at shelters with an adoption fee to offset part of the cost of care. Breeders plan for the litters, shelters plan for the unwanted. People take a chance on rescue pets because a great need exists. Most shelter dog fees are around $200 plus the tax, usually another $20 or so. Caring for animals can be expensive, but they provide companionship, fun, exercise, and unconditional love especially for older people who often have limited funds and may live alone. Cut the tax and make it easier for people to adopt. I'll close with a story of one of my dogs. I met Cheryl Bjorn in 2014 when I wrote a story about the Watton County Humane Society. She was president of the organization at the time. I asked her to name a highlight of her work at the shelter. She took me to the dog kennels and pointed to a small female pit bull about one year old. The shelter housed a lot of pit bulls that year. They can be hard to rehome. Doris had been severely injured during an attack. The shelter volunteers knew the vet bill would be substantial and finding a home for her might be difficult. But Doris was one of the friendliest and sweetest dogs they had cared for, so they decided to do the surgery and rehab. I fell in love with her after she hugged me with her front legs. She needs special accommodations and has minor chronic medical conditions, but she is happy, healthy, and loved. Her story is not unique. Neither are shelter responses to animals in similar distress. These pets are mostly always hard luck cases with nowhere else to go. I hope the Minnesota legislature can find other options to fund the budget without requiring and using sales tax from shelter pet adoptions. It makes sense to let shelters keep the full adoption fee so they can direct 100% of that money to their urgent and mostly volunteer rescue work aiding animals and it would relieve some of the financial burden on those who choose a shelter pet, making it easier to welcome someone like Doris into their homes. It's the right thing to do. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Ms. Beckendorf. Next we have um, Ms. Ann Hofstad. Are you with us, Ms. Hofstad? Apparently, Senator Weber, okay. uh, Ms. Hofstad has, has not uh, joined us. Would you like to proceed with further um, information about thank, thank you, Madam Senate Chair. Bill 1139? Um, obviously, I am in support of this bill. I, otherwise, I would not have, have authored it. Uh, and But I, I also would like to maybe turn to the A2 amendment at this point. That is in your packet, <laughs> Madam Chair and members. Um, the amendment is actually, I requested that it be drafted including pretty much the same language as the bill itself. And what this does is that this allows that sales tax exemption on private breeders as well uh, for them. And, and, I, and the reason that I have uh, proceeded with this amendment is the fact that regardless of how worthy uh, exemptions are that we as, as legislators grant, I think it's important for us to recognize that there are also other consequences on other legitimate businesses that are out there uh, when we grant such uh, exemptions and uh, then create, can create uh, you know, business issues for them as well. And I have we have requested a revenue uh, note on this amendment. The, the amendment came in late, uh, and so we do not have that yet. And recognizing that this bill would be laid over 
I have, uh, I, I would uh, move the A2 amendment and, and if we wish to debate it now, the merits of it, that's fine. But otherwise, we will have additional data in the future, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you, Senator Weber. I don't believe that's uh, necessary. Uh, <clears throat> Senator Weber has moved the A2 amendment. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed say no. The motion uh, prevails. The amendment um, is adopted. As Senator Weber has said, the... Um, the um, the summary, the Senate uh, Council's summary, is drawn to the A2 amendment, but the revenue estimate is to the bill um, as originally uh, introduced. Um, it, it, it is, as you're well aware, Senator Weber, um, <clears throat> greatly expands this um, yes. uh, this bill. And uh, we will uh, certainly work with you to get that revenue estimate and even perhaps bring the bill back before the, uh, the committee. Um, are there questions or comments, however, at this point of, um, of Senator Weber? Senator Klein. Thank you, Madam Chair and Senator Weber. So the A2, uh, I think you just said it, but just to make sure I understand it, it expands the um, scope of the bill to include dog breeders, is that correct? That is correct, Madam Chair, Senator Klein. Uh, Senator, Senator Weber, Senator Klein. Madam Chair, um, yeah, and I, I'm interested in continuing to study that as the revenue note comes forward and so forth. I will say that the testifiers were convincing to me at least in that um, these humane societies have, a, have sort of a societal function and a humane function, uh, and uh, dog breeders have a a somewhat different function. It's a commercial enterprise, and so I, they seem like different uh, enterprises to me, and I would want to think about it further. So thank you. Um, Madam, Madam Chair. Thank you, um, Senator Klein. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Senator Klein, you, you're correct. They, they do have different functions, um, and yet at the same, at the end of the day, they do provide uh, the same service or in the same um, uh, options for people to buy a pet or to adopt a pet, however you wish to phrase it. Um, you know, I remember as uh, growing up, um, you know, th there's no doubt that the cost of adopting a pet is much more expensive these days than it was 60 years ago. And, and, um, um, and I remember the dog I had growing up, unfortunately some uh, unconscious, or should I say, uh, unscrupulous pet owner actually dumped the puppy out on the road and wandered up to our place. And, uh, and uh, my dad told my mom, we need to find a place for this puppy before the boys get home or we won't get rid of it. And they didn't, and they didn't. And so, um, and, and so uh, but we, I, having uh, a number of pet breeders in my district, uh, they are very conscientious and, and uh, people uh, I've been in their facilities, and the interaction with them and their, their dogs um, tells me, because dogs do have a definite personality, uh, that they are treated well. And, and, um, uh, and I think that, as I stated earlier, it's important for us to recognize when we grant exemptions, even for worthy causes, uh, exactly how it affects um, other elements of that industry. Senator Klein. Well, thank you, um, Senator Weber. Um, the, um, I think it's important that we look at the language of what the exemption in your amendment, as well as the bill, does not apply to, okay? right. including alcoholic beverages. Right. Okay. All right, just to make that clear. A lot of the language there is not what it applies to, but what it does not apply Correct. to. Correct. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Senator Weber, do you have any final comment then? Uh, no, Madam Chair. I believe that would conclude our testimony on this bill. Okay. Um, Senate File 1139 as amended will be laid over. Our next bill is Senate File um, 1152. Uh, also, um, Senator Weber. Senator Weber, you may proceed. Okay. And I believe, um, Senator Weber, you have an amendment for this bill as well, which... Uh, yes, uh, Madam Chair, uh, I do have... Um, 
I believe it's the A1 amendment. The A1 amendment. <clears throat> Members have it in their packets. Senator Weber moves the A1 amendment. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed say no. The uh, motion prevails. The amendment is adopted. Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I appreciate a hearing on this bill. This bill has, uh, has also been introduced in previous years. Um, and, and at the core of this bill is a effort to uh, clarify confusion surrounding the tax classification of certain smaller scale solar production facilities. And uh, just to give a brief tutorial uh, to the members, Madam Chair, uh, currently there's, there's an assortment of taxing uh, structures out there. Uh, for property owners that own the underlying real estate on a solar uh, generation uh, station under one megawatt, the land underneath the solar station is taxed as uh, the, according to the land classification of the land which surrounds it. Uh, if the solar uh, const uh, installation exceeds one megawatt, uh, then a 3A classification or a commercial classification is applied uh, to the ground. Uh, and this bill seeks to address the issue of when you have uh, a number, a multiple uh, assortment of solar uh, panel installations on a property uh, that collectively uh, form, uh, be, produce more than one megawatt of power. Right now, there is a situation whereby, be, and the, these, they also have to have different name plates, in other words, different ownership of that particular uh, solar generation site. Uh, and what happens is, is that they can claim underneath that one megawatt for the individual site, but collectively, they may total more than one megawatt. Uh, the Association of Minnesota Counties has, has worked with the solar industry uh, to clarify this language. Uh, in some respects, they were surprised that this actually wound up being an issue because they hadn't really expected that situation to develop. And so what this does, it just states uh, this, this bill, and, and the amendment further clarifies it, that, um, uh, that the taxation of properties with multiple name-plated solar installations that total over one megawatt in aggregate uh, would then be subject to the 3A or commercial classification. And so I have with me today, uh, Madam Chair, uh, testifiers uh, to speak to this. I have Jeff Johnson. He's a retired Stearns County Assessor Auditor. Uh, property Tax Services Director. Property Tax Services Director, and Joe Persky, Stearns County Commissioner. And I believe Mr. Johnson will be the first uh, testifier, uh, Madam Chair. Mr. Johnson, welcome to the committee. Please identify yourself um, for the record, and we are uh, welcome your testimony. Good morning, Madam Chair and committee members. My name is Jeff Johnson. I was the Stearns County Property Services Director until retiring from county government last year. I have about 42 years of experience in the assessment field. I also served as a legislative committee member for the Minnesota Association of Assessing Officers, which is an affiliate of the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm here today with Stearns County Commissioner uh, Joe Persky to address Senate File 1152 and why it should be enacted. This bill restores some much needed tax equity on a local level because the current law no longer provides for the fair and equitable assessment of land supporting most multiple solar generating systems. The proposed change is important to many counties because of these two conditions. One, an upsurge in the practice of clustering smaller systems on the same parcel by solar developers. And two, the inability of assessors to classify much of this land as 3A commercial for tax purposes. It has been estimated that there are between 125 to 150 solar energy generating systems subject to reclassification under this proposal. We believe this bill will close an unintended loophole in the property tax code and promote transparency and uniformity in the classification of these properties across the state. These are two very important benchmarks uh, in, related to the property tax system. The law guiding uh, assessors in classifying this law simply says this, that land supporting a larger solar, system, or solar energy generating system that is greater than one megawatt 
is used primarily for the production of solar and is classified as 3A commercial. While on the other hand, land supporting uh, systems that are generally uh, less than or equal to one megawatt in output capacity is not for solar production, is classified like the surrounding property without regard to the system. Uh, the latter part of this guidance clearly directs assessors to ignore the primary use of land. So if the property was classified as agricultural based on its use before solar development, it will remain agricultural after solar development. The production tax law also provides direction to assessors by addressing the aggregation of these systems. It states that if multiple systems are located on the same property, they can only be combined for tax purposes if the ownership, sales arrangement, interconnection, revenue sharing, and financing are the same. They're built in the same 12-month period, and the systems are considered to be a single development. Since most solar farms today are, uh, do not meet the uh, greater than one megawatt nameplate capacity threshold, they do not pay production tax, nor is the land classified as commercial, even in most instances when there are multiple systems located on the property. This circumstance means that solar farms constructed incrementally on the same property allow some developers and landowners to evade commercial taxes. Typically, what we have found is that similar properties having gas, water, and electric utilities, as well as billboards and communication tower sites are taxed as commercial based on their primary use. As you can see, there are two distinct classification practices which have led to concerns raised by local government officials and the public about the equitable treatment administered by assessors. Thus, we have a tax equity problem because assessors have no authority to change the property tax classification of land where smaller multiple systems are located regardless of the change in land use. At this time, uh, Commissioner Persky and I will share an example uh, from Stearns County that highlights this problem and offer a solution and support for it. This parcel is 157 acres and is located in Brockway Township near Sartell City. It's owned by a family farm which has chosen to diversify its operation by leasing part of the irrigated field to a solar developer for an amount well above the rent paid for tillable land. We understand that uh, rents paid for developments of this kind uh, generally range in the area of $800 to $2,000 per acre compared to about $200 to $300 for uh, irrigated farmland. In 2017, uh, the 15 acres in the th southeast corner that's delineated by the red border uh, was improved with a one megawatt solar uh, system. A production tax was not billed, nor was the land reclassified as commercial. It retained the agricultural classification, but the green acres tax deferral ended. Two years later, the area that's highlighted in the yellow border uh, is over eight acres in size. It's adjacent to the existing solar farm, and it was rezoned to accommodate a future one megawatt system. If this system is built, the nameplate capacity could not be combined for tax purposes because the second system does not meet the requirements cited in the production tax law. More important is that 23 acres would no longer be used agriculturally, but would remain classified as agriculture and not pay a commercial tax that larger solar generating systems and similar use properties pay. This time I'm going to yield to Commissioner Persky so he may be able to share some of his thoughts about this. <clears throat> Welcome to the committee, Commissioner. Um, if you'd identify yourself, please, for the record. Thank you, Welcome Madam Chair, and it's good to testimony. see you again. Uh, Joe Persky, Stearns County Commissioner. Uh, let me just say that I'm quite familiar with this property, and it, it, if you just take a look at the picture, it, it kind of sells our message itself. It's all, it's all right there in front of you. You can see there's an existing one meg uh, solar garden there. If they now go ahead and uh, move forward and put the second one in there. If they wait one year, they would be able to put the second one in and it would also then be uh, taxed under agriculture. That piece of property can actually be expanded as you, as you can see where the irrigator would swing is they could then add a third and a fourth and a fifth and completely fill that field with solar gardens. They would still be subject only to the uh, property tax for agriculture, which is approximately 30 to $50 per acre um, on each of those uh, solar gardens. Now, if we were to change it, they would then be subject to the commercial tax, which would be a, a slightly uh, uh, about half as much, again, as that amount, uh, which then would be fair because, again, they're not doing a, a community solar garden of one meg. They've collectively established it eight megs or, or more on that property. 
only two miles away from that property near our high school, there's an existing solar garden that's, that's two megs. They are paying the uh, commercial property tax. But here again, this one is skirting the issue by having only the one, one meg and uh, uh, agricultural tax on. It's not an anti-solar uh, uh, proposal. It's a matter of tax fairness. Uh, as you know, the, the, the townships and the counties, especially in the rural areas, are, are strapped for, for, for resources. They've got gravel, they've got ditches, they've got culverts and bridges that they're gonna need to uh, maintain. Th these gardens are out for 25 years. So over the course of the 25 years, this becomes a significant amount of money for the townships and for the, for the county. Thank you, Mr. Commissioner. Questions for um, Senator Weber. Senator Weber, um, uh, how widespread um, is this um, a situation in the, uh, through, you know, in the in the state of Minnesota, um, where <clears throat> uh, solar farms are um, uh, can actually be built because because of the kind of sun that they need and so forth. Um, um, where does this happen? I mean, if you had a map of the state, where would you see these solar farms and where would they be using <coughs> um, uh, this kind of, uh, um, I don't even know what to, what to call it, but it's um, it doesn't meet the one megawatt and then, but it gets, it gets, so it stays as ag property. I'm trying to yeah. make sure I understand this. And then it adds property that's used as a solar farm that together would be more than um, uh, one megawatt, but and it would be class 3A. But here it's like little by little by little, and it's all ag land. Is that, am I understanding that correctly? And how prevalent? Where does this happen? I mean, what a good deal. Uh, <laughs> thank, mean, yeah, really? Th thank you. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. It's my understanding that right now there's about 150 parcels in 38, I think it's 38 different counties wow. uh, under, in which this situation occurs. And those counties are found, uh, well, Stearns County and counties around it all the way down to the southern edge of the state. And, and so... Um, that uh, it, it, it isn't congested in just a, a couple counties, but it's spread over, over 38. So the, the uh, revenue estimate, um, Senator Weber, um, shows that it's uh, uh, negligible. Um, however, um, would there not be some sort of shift that's occurring if, um, if these properties came to be classified as 3A? Madam Chair, if the, if the uh, and I, I will allow uh, Mr. Johnson to speak to that, but in this situation, actually what would happen is properties such as that would see the real estate tax increase. Uh, and so... Uh, so it shift away from the other property. That is, that so is. So there's a shift, it's right. just onto this property um, and off of um, other properties within the county. That's okay. correct, and I'd like, like Mr. Johnson to speak to that as Mr. well. Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Madam Chair, and committee members, and Senator Weber. Um, in Stearns County, we have eight properties uh, that have multiple systems on them, or will have multiple systems on them, only one of which is subject to taxation and reclassified as commercial. Um, what we've identified in the tax analysis that we've done, which mirrors the uh, tax analysis done by the Minnesota Department of Revenue, is that the average increase in tax would be about $25 to $60 per acre more uh, so in other words, the uh, incremental change in tax would be approximately $600 on average. Now I want to caution you that depending upon the previous classification of the property, if it was agricultural homestead or non-homestead, uh, the acreage that's involved, its location and land values, uh, that that tax difference could be higher or lower than that. Uh, I think the revenues projection was that based on 150 last year, they're saying the 125 estimate this year, uh, that the tax amount was approximately $40,000 in difference. And so if you break that down that, uh, based upon acreage, which are, which are uh, devoted to supporting these uh, solar energy systems running from six to 10 acres in size, 
we're talking 26 to 44 dollars difference in tax per year so that mirrors what we're seeing here in Stearns County on average Sarah Nelson well thank you um, <clears throat> thank you madam chair a very interesting discussion <clears throat> not a totally new discussion but a very relevant discussion and I, I several things come to my mind one uh, certainly this is an issue that I've heard about as well uh, in Dodge County a, a lot of solar in Dodge County as well um, I just have a couple um, concerns one has to do with with fairness and that is that uh, these uh, installations were installed under the existing law. Uh, and now we realize, oh, maybe that's not accurate. Maybe that doesn't serve our purpose well. So we're going to bring this new legislation forward. But it reminds me a little bit of what we talked about with, uh, well, well, it is, first, it is our responsibility in the legislature to bring new legislation forward. It does remind me of something that uh, we've been talking about with the department, uh, which it has to do with suddenly taxing other energy uh, production things like utility poles and such, which we have never done for 75 years. But now all of a sudden, uh, there's a real, uh, some, some new thinking along that line, and now we're going to tax those. Um, I am concerned about the existing uh, properties that followed the law that set up these uh, different uh, solar arrays according to the law. I would be very comfortable supporting this if there were a grandfather in there. Uh, it is changing the taxing structure of a business that has already uh, started <clears throat> that, in, that, in, that concerns me. And I know, uh, Senator Weber, you have a lot of, I think, um, wind in your district as well. And I, and, and I have a lot of wind in my district as well. And I have to wonder, how would it impact <clears throat> the uh, wind industry if suddenly we changed a taxing structure for those. And, and there, that may have already been changed. But to think about starting a business or starting <clears throat> or increasing uh, a, a different revenue stream in your business is always hard in Minnesota. And I'm just very cautious about the retroactive nature of this. And since there are 25-year there leases, I think the question would be, let those leases expire at the current structure and then make sure that all new leases going forward fit what we see as a better uh, solution today. But I, I, I don't think it's exactly fair to, to go back and, and uh, do this uh, after those have been set up and entered into business agreements. Well, um, Senator, Senator Nelson, um, I would be sympathetic toward that, except that correcting this at this point is a very small cost across the across the state, and so I I'm not sure I would consider it in this instance um, an an over an overburden. I'm just um, th trying to think through your um, your objection or or adding a complication to this proposal that's uh, in a sense not worth the money because it the money it is so low <laughs> um, if it was you know a few million dollars then I would think um, having a grandfather clause would be uh, something to uh, consider just just as a, a counter to your point Senator Nelson yeah, yes madam chair I think those are good comments but in, in addition, uh, I would say I understand also the, the interest in preserving ag land as, as ag land. Uh, but, but to the retroactive nature, um, while it might be a small statewide amount, when it's one person trying to, or one entity, or one family trying to keep the family farm um, alive and in the family, uh, I think it, it could be significant. Um, and, and the fact is, that, as we've noted, there's not too many of these parcels. Uh, and so uh, but that's kind of where my, my thoughts are uh, at the moment on this. Uh, let's, let's protect the retroact. The, let's not make it retroactive. Uh, Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, two things. Uh, first, as it relates to the wind production tax, uh, or to the wind towers, 
uh, they, they currently pay a, a production tax, and that is the tax that, that that pays. The underlying property owner does not pay additional tax, uh, as according to my understanding. Uh, as it relates to the solar farms, uh, the solar industry is in support of this bill. Uh, they, they did not expect that loophole to be there. They expected that the uh, properties, if they had multiple uh, wind farm or solar farm installations that exceeded one megawatt that they would be paying 3A or, or uh, commercial tax rates on the underlying ground. And, and so um, I, I feel, uh, I, I am as concerned as the next person obviously with rural Minnesota with, based on my district, uh, but I, I do not see this as, as a large problem. And Madam Chair, I believe that Commissioner Persky would like to enter into a conversation also. Yes, Commissioner Persky. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. And, and Senator Nelson, I appreciate your uh, uh, concern about looking for fairness. Coming from a family of seven, I always wanted to make sure we all had our fair share. So uh, looking at fairness on, on this issue, um, as the Senator had mentioned, Yes, uh, the, the industry itself was not oftentimes aware that this was a problem. They were assuming that when they put this in that it would be a commercial tax. Uh, also with the property owners. Some of the property owners, as, as they're coming in to, uh, to us at the Planning Commission, were making the assumption that it was going to be similar to a, uh, a billboard or similar to a, 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 a tower, that it was, it was going to be tacit at the commercial level. I think also, again, if you take a look at the, the difference in revenue, taking a look at, at the picture that you have of, of the diagram there, th that, that dark color, the, the ag land is, is, is being rented at $200, $300 an acre. That solar garden is bringing revenues from $800 to $2,000. The money is there, and it's, I don't think it's a significant amount. It would also uh, be better to go ahead, make the correction now, than, than to keep that on the books for the next 25 years. I think, I think now is the time to make the change. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair, um, Senator Nelson, I'd just like to speak to the administrative concerns of grandfathering. Uh, as an assessor uh, for many years, uh, when laws uh, grandfathered certain provisions, it created uh, a lot of additional work and cost to counties uh, to carry out that uh, practice, particularly if it goes on for many years. And then there's always a series of questions that come up later after the grandfathering clause has been administered as to when does it expire and when do we add new uh, properties onto that. Also, I'd like to mention, uh, in addition to uh, the comments shared by uh, Commissioner Persky, I do recall during the application process at least twice at Stearns County where uh, some solar development companies have even offered to pay a pill to lieu of tax uh, because they knew that these types of properties were not going to be subject to taxation and they wanted to pay their fair share to support the townships and the counties, you know, particularly in the area of road maintenance and, and, the, and the other expenses that are incurred. Thank you. Any other uh, questions? Yeah. Senator uh, Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, very good discussion. And I, I would say that just to uh, pinpoint further this discussion, my concern is with the landowners um, and how does changing, there's two things we need to talk about. One is the property tax change, which might not be as, which is, could be significant, but then also the production tax. So I, we're talking about two additional um, expenses on, onto the landowners. And my question is, they have entered into 25-year contracts. And now we're going to change uh, the, the, um, the mathematical uh, feasibleness of those contracts. That's my concern. Um, and, I, and, and to your point, I understand somewhat. I've, I've not been an assessor, but I do understand the complications of grandfathers. You know, does it proceed to the next owner and all those type of things. Um, but I would say in this case, and it might be helpful, uh, Madam Chair, if we got a list of those 135 parcels and how much time is left on their contracts. That could also help us further determine the significance of this change and whom it might affect and for how long. So my, my, my bigger concern is uh, for the landowners, they've entered into a contract and now the state is changing uh, their um, liability for production tax and then increasing their property tax liability. So those are the two issues that I think just deserve uh, I would need to know a little bit more about. 
Senator Weber. Thank you, Madam Chair. And Senator Nelson, I may have misunderstood what you said, but the property owners do not pay the production tax. Right. It's the solar company that pays the production tax. And so they will never be saddled with that additional cost, regardless of the size of the solar farm. And so. Mr. Johnson. Madam Chair uh, and committee members, uh, this proposal that's before you does not impose a production tax on these smaller uh, solar generating systems. That's not the intent. Right. Uh, the intent is basically to allow the land supporting multiple solar f farms that cannot be combined for the purposes of the production tax to be combined when the aggregate total of that is over one megawatt. And uh, that will allow assessors to classify these properties and continue the practice of assessing properties based on its primary use, which is a universal standard that's applied to all real property. And so if it doesn't rise to the threshold of greater than one megawatt, we're going to leave these alone. And that's why that amendment is being offered is to exclude uh, those properties that are referred to as uh, distributed solar, the individual panels on houses and businesses. We, we're not going to be monkeying around with those types of properties. To uh, Senator Nelson's point about uh, the property tax change, uh, we don't believe that this is going to curtail development. Uh, when we've uh, presented uh, tax proposals to uh, solar development companies that were inquiring about the taxation of these properties, uh, that never seemed to be an issue, at least in our district, uh, when those tax figures were shared with them. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, Senator uh, Weber, uh, does this bill have a um, house companion? Uh, it does, and it's my understanding that that bill is being heard in the House uh, today as well. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> um, Senator Weber, as I you know, look at the revenue estimate and, and et cetera, uh, ordinarily um, I would put this bill on, the, uh, on that list that I uh, talked about, but because of the discussion we're having here and the questions that are being raised, I'm just going to lay it over for in inclusion uh, uh, possibility in the uh, in the omnibus bill. Very good. Thank Is you, that, Madam Chair. Okay. okay. Um, so, any further discussion on Senate File 1152? Seeing none. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, uh, thank you. Uh, Senator Weber. Who is the uh, House author of your bill? Who's Pardon? the House author of 1152? Uh, Representative Paul Anderson. Paul Anderson, okay. Uh, next on the agenda is another bill by Senator Weber, Senate File 1155. Senator Weber. I might add that that, that was a very um, informative and educational discussion uh, and presentation uh, uh, for me, and I really appreciate your testifiers as, as well as the clarity that you brought to the subject matter. So thank you very much, Senator. Thank you, Senator Madam Weber. Chair. So now we have um, 1155. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we have a wide array of subjects this morning. Uh, we have went from uh, animal shelters uh, to solar gardens to uh, railroads. And... Um, and the you short line put infrastructure. Them in one bill, you know. Pardon? You could have put them all in one bill. <laughs> yeah. It would have really be fun. <laughs> but it would have cut down on my table time up here, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's a German day again today. Yes, you, I see that. <laughs> yes. Um, but anyway, thank you for considering this bill. Uh, this uh, will benefit uh, businesses, producers, and consumers across our state. Uh, I think first probably uh, a definition of short line railroads would be, be in order. Uh, it's my understanding that at the federal level there are, there are three classifications of railroads. There's class one, two, and three. Class one railroads are the large railroads that go across numerous states. Uh, you know, uh, Burlington Northern is a railroad and, and, uh, that comes through my uh, territory and, uh, and others as well. And then you have class two and three. Class two and three uh, railroads, uh, their classification is based on their gross income, but class two and three railroads are oftentimes referred to as short line. Class two railroads can cross uh, maybe a couple of states, but class one railroads are typically found within the state itself. And there are 18 short line railroads in Minnesota. 
uh, that provide first and last mile service to communities across our state. And, and except for one, all of our short line railroads are private small businesses formed after the railroad industry was deregulated more than 40 years ago. And typically what they have done is they have taken over entire or portions of tracks that were officially abandoned by the previous uh, railroad owner. And, uh, and they have sought to keep uh, trains moving from our uh, production facilities, uh, grain terminals, uh, uh, processing plants, et cetera, and uh, in an effort to keep uh, transportation costs down. And, and certainly uh, they provide another use in that they keep uh, heavy loads off of our roads, which we always have a need for continual uh, money to fix uh, and repair and replace our road system as well. And what we are asking for here is a modernization tax credit. Or the SLIM is the acronym given it, short line modernization credit, or infrastructure modernization tax credit. And what this would do is that many of these railroads are in need of replacing. Uh, the rails themselves, the ties, many of these were built uh, probably 60, 70, 80 or longer, years ago or longer. And today's rail cars have been enlarged, they incre have increased loads, and loads which are quite frankly not able to be hauled on these particular railroad tracks well. I think the speed limit on the short line railroad through uh, my community is 10 miles an hour. And so um, anyone on a bicycle can outrace the train very easily because they just aren't allowed to go faster than that. And so as they go ahead and proceed with upgrading these tracks, uh, and they also have an opportunity to produce sidings uh, and, and uh, spurs off onto uh, adjoining land if they can develop a, an industrial park and expand industry and production capabilities within rural Minnesota. And so uh, it's just, I think, an important element. And this credit, uh, that the bill itself that you have in front of you, uh, would provide a credit up to 50% of the qualified costs up to a maximum of $5,000 per mile uh, of railroad improved. Um, now, I will let my testifiers talk about the cost to upgrade a mile of track these days. Uh, but the other provisions of this bill, uh, subdivision one includes definitions. Uh, subdivision two defines the amount of the credit that's allowed. Subdivision three states that credits can be transferred to other taxpayers. Unused credits would be allowed to be, if they have, they can be carried forward, but would be allowed to be marketed to other taxpayers that would have need of them. Uh, rules from transfer to multiple owners. Uh, if a credit is purchased by a partnership or, or S-Corp, uh, the members are allowed a credit equal to their ownership interest. It will always be dictated by that. And also, if non-residents are allowed to use the credit as provided under other provisions of tax code, uh, it's also possible to have owners of our short line railroads that are non-residents of the state of Minnesota. And, uh, and another item that was put in about the revisers uh, that, as I understand, is allowed in a lot of different tax credit bills. A uh, short line tax credit can be used as a credit against premium taxes and carried forward for five years. Uh, so those are the basic provisions of the bill, Madam Chair. And, uh, and I have with me uh, today and available to the committee uh, two testifiers at the table. Uh, Dan Kipley, a Vice President for Business Development of the Ellison Eastern Railroad. I have Tina Ryberg, Vice President of the Twin Cities and Western Railroad. And joining us uh, through Zoom is Ryan Pitty, uh, Vice President of Mickelson and Company. He has worked on this credit in other states and can answer questions as to how this credit particularly works. Uh, and at this point, uh, I have finished my re introductory remarks, uh, Madam Chair, and I would turn the testifier's table over to Dan Kipley. Um, <clears throat> uh, thank you, Senator Weber. And um, Mr. Kipley, if you would identify yourself for the record, we'll welcome your testimony. Thank you, Madam Chair and, and members. My name is Dan Kipley, and I'm with the Ellison Eastern Railroad, and we operate our line in Nobles and Rock County in the southwestern corner of the state. Our line runs from Manly to Worthington. The short line infrastructure tax credit bill will keep hundreds of rail customers across Minnesota connected 
to the National Freight Line Network through an upgraded and more efficient short line rail system. Our railroad provides customers with access to more competitive transportation options and far greater market reach than otherwise possible by trucks alone. Freight rail takes trucks off the road, helps the environment by reducing air pollution, and reduces highway damage. As an example, one ton of freight can be moved nearly 500 miles by rail, but one ton of freight can only be moved 134 miles by truck to give you a difference in example of efficiencies. Allow me to offer a couple examples. Feed Energy and North Star Liquids, both out of Laverne, they ship animal nutrition products. And uh, being a farm kid, those terms mean liquid feed for cattle and hogs. It's imperative that we upgrade eight bridges now between Laverne and Worthington to handle the 286,000 pound rail cars that are being used that need to be shipped so that those companies can be more competitive. Right now, we're limited to 263,000 pound rail because these bridges need to be improved. That cost alone would be over $2 million. Ellison Eastern also is in the process of making nearly $6 million in improvements through a Consolidated Rail Infrastructure and Safety Improvement Grant, or CRISI, that was received. That capital investment needs to be completed before grant reimbursement. I need to offer a shout out to Senators Klobuchar and Smith, as well as former Representative Hegedorn, for helping secure that federal grant. MDOT staff also assisted in preparing for our grant application. At $5,000 a mile, this tax credit would allow Ellison Eastern an additional $210,000 a year to help complete this work in a more timely fashion and improve service for other customers like New Vision Co-op, Borough Resources, and Safety Clean. Other short lines also need similar upgrades. They need to replace worn ties, upgraded rail, redistribute ballasts, and again, upgrade bridge structures. Enacting this bill will encourage Minnesota short lines to continue making the major investments required to serve our customers and create more local, well-paying jobs at the same time. Again, this tax credit will help us provide faster, safer, and more efficient rail service, which is good for our customers, good for our economy, and good for our environment. And the 10 miles an hour, if once we get this rail upgraded, we may get up to 25. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair and members, for listening today. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Ryberg, if you'd identify yourself, please, for the record. We welcome your testimony. Madam Chair and members, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak here today in support of Senate File 1155. My name is Tina Ryberg. I'm the Vice President of Administration and Operations for the Twin Cities and Western Railroad and the Minnesota Prairie Line, both based in Glencoe, Minnesota. Uh, we are members of the Minnesota Regional Railroads Association, which is the trade association for the four large transcontinental railroads and the short line railroads here that operate within our state of Minnesota. Our two railroads operate from the Twin Cities through central Minnesota and one that goes out beyond the South Dakota border. The bill that you have before you is patterned after a similar, very successful federal short line infrastructure improvement program. It also mirrors a program that's currently in place in nine other states that help accelerate the needed infrastructure of improvements to tracks, ties, and just general infrastructure. Railroading is a very capital intense business and this bill will help cover some of those costs to help us provide that better service. And there's also several economic benefits that will result from this credit. First, it will help shippers, large and small, that are connected to the National Freight Rail Network. Much of Minnesota's agricultural, the mining, the manufacturing industries depend on short lines like us and their railroad service to move their products on the first and last miles and the long journeys that it has to many places across our country and around the world. Better track and infrastructure means that we can handle the more modern, large rail cars, which are now standard 
on the large railroads and thus provide more reliable service. Secondly, the prospect of ongoing rail service that rail shippers can rely on for the long term because of the new ties, because of the improved bridges, because of the new track, is often a catalyst for local business development. Some examples include improvements to the Minnesota Prairie Line from Norwood Young America to Winthrop, supported millions of dollars of new investments in a local ethanol facility, and attracted a new animal feed processing company that became a rail shipper last year. In 2021, because of the improvements made by the Minnesota Prairie Line, the Farmers Cooperative Elevator and Echo had invested $6 million in a new grain handling facility that allowed them to restart rail shipments for the first time in over 10 years. A co-op located next to the Minnesota Prairie Line spent over $10 million on a new fertilizer facility and is building track into that facility this year so they can take advantage of the rail economics. There's businesses in Appleton, Montevideo, and Danube that have invested well over $20 million in expansions between 2015 and 2017 because they knew that they could depend on the service provided by the Twin Cities and Western Railroad. Every one of these businesses produce jobs and they add to the tax bases of their rural communities. And the same thing is happening on all the other short lines that operate throughout Minnesota. The federal short line tax credit has been important in helping us deal with some of the most critical and immediate infrastructure needs. It's helped us deal with the high cost of capital improvements to our railroads, and more recently, the impacts of inflation. A Minnesota tax credit will allow us to catch up on some of the more expensive deferred maintenance projects that we have, such as replacing bridges and the aging track. And it will help Minnesota short line railroads attract and support additional jobs and investment in Minnesota communities. Madam Chair, I could go on all day long about the benefits that short lines provide uh, to the rural communities and the economic growth that we help foster. Um, but my hope here today is that we have the short line infrastructure modernization tax credit, Senate file 1155, will make it into the omnibus tax bill here this year. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> we have someone also to testify um, remotely, uh, Mr. Pitty. Are you there? Uh, good morning, Madam Chair. Yes, I'm. Welcome here. to the committee, uh, Mr. Pitty. We're pleased to welcome your testimony. I apologize. I don't know that my camera's working, so um, sorry. Okay. Um, we can good hear morning. You. Good morning, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Um, my name is Ryan Peaty with Mickelson and Company. Um, we're a small finance consulting um, business uh, located in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and we have the privilege of helping a number of short lines in Minnesota and across the country uh, help finance infrastructure improvement work with tax credits, loans, grants, and, and other programs. And we're also involved with helping facilitate economic development opportunities <laughs> along the short line rail infrastructure networks. Um, I, the, I'd say the summary button on um, Senate Bill 1155 is this is all about economic development. It's about accelerating um, track reinvestment across the state. It's about pro providing a more robust short line infrastructure network to serve existing customers, but also position them to attract new customers. Um, several years ago, there was a study that was conducted that analyzed some of the long-term freight rail funding needs of short lines in the state of Minnesota. At that time, the estimate was somewhere north of $750 million. Freight railroading is capital intensive. We've seen short lines across the country spend anywhere from 10 to 20,000 per mile annually just to maintain the track. What compounds that is 40% of their annual maintenance is unplanned because of either derailments or maybe a bridge that's got critical repairs that need to be made, or maybe there's a flood, et cetera. And so what this tax credit does is provides a very flexible and adaptable mechanism for railroads to invest based on the customer's needs and demands. Um, it is a successful model that's been implemented in nine other states. 
Um, the results that have come from that have showed a significant amount of economic impact, activity, customer growth. And currently there are six other states um, outside of Minnesota that are considering similar legislation to incentivize reinvestment and also spur industrial development. And so this is a this is a good bill. It's one that's not a handout. These short lines in the state need to spend their own money first uh, before generating a tax credit. If they're able to earn a tax credit based on what they spend, they can either retain it for their own tax bill. The transferability mechanism really is something that's important for short lines to help finance additional track work because it is so expensive. And so um, very much appreciate your time this morning uh, considering this bill that would be great for positioning the state of Minnesota, its short line infrastructure um, and help help them to remain competitive. I'm happy to answer any questions, but thank you for your time. Uh, thank you, sir. Are there uh, questions or comments? Um, Senator House Chow. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator Weber, for bringing this bill forward and for allowing me to sign on as well. Um, my son, Henry, is three years old, and he's obsessed with trains. And last summer, we had the chance to go on the uh, North Shore Scenic Railroad, and it was full. Uh, people from all over the state, all over the region, all over the country uh, are there to have that experiential experience uh, going up the North Shore, seeing those views, um, and, and being on a passenger rail. Uh, and watching my son's eye as we were on that uh, was an experience in and of itself. And in fact, I'm going to be taking him up the North Shore this weekend for some constituent outreach. And I'm going to tell him uh, that we had this hearing and that we talked about trains and we talked about supporting uh, these kinds of things. He's not going to know what I'm talking about, but what he will hear is that uh, that we're talking about trains and he'll be excited. Um, so again, you know, there's a lot of different uh, tier two and tier three railroads across our state uh, from your region as well as mine. And one of them is, is you know, scenic and tourist related like, like in my region. And I'm just thankful that we're, uh, uh, you know, hearing this testimony and I look forward to supporting it. Thank you, Senator Weber. Thank you, Senator House Child. Um, the, uh, um, I'm going to be starting another list, okay? <laughs> and it's going to be bills of interest to Ann Rusk. <laughs> and this is going to be the first one uh, on it. I, I think some of you, you know, uh, in terms of love of trains, that um, my uh, great-grandfather, my grandfather, um, uh, worked on a short line in Virginia. And um, also, although it wasn't a short line, uh, my family was associated with the Atlantic and Danville uh, Railroad in um, uh, in uh, in Virginia. My great grandfather uh, died of yellow fever um, on one of the trips that he was uh, he was on, and and left his uh, family of four sons and his wife. Um, and my uh, grandfather then had to stop going to school when he was eight years old and start working. And then eventually he, he was uh, an engineer uh, on the railroad uh, and um, in the uh, railroad museum um, uh, out near Chesterfield, Virginia, uh, he, his lantern is there. So it's very special to me. Uh, Senator Putnam. Thank you, Madam Chair, and uh, thank you, Senator Weber, for allowing me to sign on to this bill as well. Um, I have a similar romantic fascination with trains, uh, as that suggested by uh, Senator Hosschild and his child. Uh, I remember as a kid uh, taking a train across the country because we couldn't afford to fly, uh, and there was something just beautiful about being able to stare out the window. Um, but as a corollary, I guess, to Senator Hosschild's comments, is they also do really important work. And it was probably about six, seven months ago, they actually let me drive a train. Uh, the short rail train in St. Cloud. They actually let me drive it, which was probably a poor decision uh, on their part, but it was really fantastic and super fun. And uh, as impressed I was by that experience, how powerful that experience was, uh, I remember just seeing how dilapidated the rail was uh, and the horrible condition that some of this infrastructure is in uh, and hearing the stories uh, from the guy who let me drive the train about how expensive it is to fix uh, rail. Uh, and some of the different legal and other kind of hassles that they have to go into. Uh, and it's incredibly important to the economy of central Minnesota, that short line right is. So I'm uh, very glad to support this bill, and thank you, Madam Chair, for hearing it. Sure. 
Um, uh, Senator Weber, any further comment? Well, thank you, Madam Chair. Just a couple. Uh, you know, with the, the cost to replace a mile of track approaching half a million to a million dollars, uh, and, and it, its reference has been made to the capital intensive business that this is, and I think you can see uh, what that does uh, to, to uh, a, a company having to foot those kind of costs. And also, as we look at, in, in my neck of the woods, uh, being a agricultural area, uh, so many of our uh, our businesses, our farm supply businesses, you know, for years it was have as little inventory on hand as possible because of the carrying costs. Now, with inflation, with supply chain issues, uh, they're going back to having warehouses full of product, be it fertilizer, et cetera, simply in order to have it available for their customers and also to guarantee their cost at that point. The cost of carrying it has become less expensive than the cost uh, than the inflationary cost of the product itself. And so this is a very important bill, I believe, uh, for all of Minnesota that's served by short-line railroads. I thank my testifiers for this bill and for all my bills today, and thank you for uh, granting us a hearing on them. Absolutely. Any further questions or comments for Senator Weber or his um, testifiers? Then Senate File 1155 will be laid over for uh, inclusion um, consideration uh, in the omnibus bill. Thank you very Thank much. You. The next bill, the last bill, uh, is Senate File 697, Senator Housechild. And Senator Housechild, I, I promise not to tear up over pilt payments, okay? <laughs> I'm a little scared. <laughs> Senator House trial. Uh, Senator file uh, 697 is before us. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Thanks for the opportunity to present Senate file 697, which provides some modest reforms to the payment in lieu of taxes program. PILT was passed in 1979 and is defined in Minnesota statute 477A.10. The purpose of PILT is to compensate local units of government for the loss of tax base from state ownership of land and the need to provide services for that state land. This is especially important for local units of government with large proportions of state land. For example, 95%, let me repeat that, 95% of the state's 8 million acres of PILT land are located in the 22 counties in northern Minnesota. Unfortunately, since the 90s, these 22 counties have gone from receiving over 50% of the PILT formula dollars to now less than 10%. This is despite encompassing, again, 95% of those public lands. The amount of acreage of lost tax base for many northern counties is staggering. For example, in Cook County, 93% of the land is publicly owned. In Lake County, 82%. Kuchiching County, 70%. Without adequate PILT payments, these northern counties must raise property taxes on their residents to pay for the existing county services and inflationary costs. Luckily, the PILT reforms in this bill were agreed upon in the 2022 Omnibus Tax Bill. These reforms include an increase in the per acre PILT payment rates on county lands from $2 to $3. It creates a two-tiered payment formula based on the total PILT acreage in a county for counties whose total number of eligible acres is equal to or greater than 25% of total acreage, it would be 18 cents an acre. And for counties who to whose total number of eligible acres is equal to or greater than 10% of total acreage, 8 cents an acre. It also changes the appraised value formula to be based on either the current appraised value of land or the most recent appraised value. It also adds an inflation adjustment to per acre rates. Northern Minnesota is the playground of the state. Uh, our state wouldn't be the same place that it is without Northern Minnesota. From the North Shore and the Boundary Waters to our state parks and lakes. This formula is meant to help supplement our local governments for maintaining and keeping these lands public for all of our benefits. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. I have testifi testifiers and I will stand for any questions you may have. Uh, Senator Housechuck, could we maybe um, start with just going through the um, through the bill? I, I know the major thing is two dollars to three dollars. Yep. Um, 
uh, and um, the uh, what is the um, what is the thrust of the section three and, and maybe um, if it's um, that technical we can have the help from um, Senate Council and then this I'm, I'm interested in a provision of this study of state-owned Lakeshore if you could explain that so chair Two I think you were asking about section three first was that yes, your that's correct so this one is about the inflation adjustment so this would account for the inflation adjustment uh, each year and then section four I believe is what you asked about as well um, so this would do an evaluation by the DNR of state-owned lakeshore properties and report on the valuation methods of those values of acreage on shoreline and and Senator uh, House child is there um, is there a fiscal note associated with a study um, I don't think it would come in on the the uh, on the revenue estimate or, uh, I would ask uh, chair rest I would ask council that yeah, question Mr. because I, I didn't see that on the revenue note either Mr. Sylvia Madam Chair, members, I'm not aware of a fiscal note specific to Section 4 of this proposal. So this is just, um, uh, Mr. Celia, Senator Housechild, this is just a directive to them and uh, for the uh, uh, Department of Revenue and the DNR to absorb the cost. Is that your understanding? That, that's correct, Madam Chair. Uh, all right. Any other questions before we hear from um, Mr. Carlson, seeing none, um, Mr. Carlson, if you would, a welcome to the committee, if you'd identify yourself for the record. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm Keith Carlson. I'm a consultant that was hired by the Northern County Business Coordinating Board um, to do a study of PILT back in 1921. I believe the committee uh, has a uh, copy. You don't of that mean study 1921. I'm sorry. You don't mean 19. I mean we're back in the I, I'm early sorry. 20th 20, century 20, here. <laughs> I don't think. I, I'm I really I'm dating don't think myself, Madam Chair, because I've been around here for a long time. <laughs> I, I understand that. Okay. Um, anyways, um, I have uh, prepared a PowerPoint, I believe, which a copy, which is also in your packets, but I hope it's projecting right now on the screen here. Uh, and I will take some is. time to uh, go over what's the history of PILT and why this bill. Um, as I said, uh, PILT, as the representative senator indicated, uh, PILT dates back to 1979. Um, it uh, is intended to compensate for both the direct and indirect costs relating to state-owned natural resources lands. All 87 counties uh, Mr. Carlson, PILT. you need to stop for a second to get the PowerPoint operational if you just, just we do okay. have. Is it on at we're this point? We're, um, we're waiting on the technology at this point. <clears throat> Mr. Carlson, we just see your, uh, your desktop picture. I don't know if you have your PowerPoint actually the up on your computer. On, so. Uh, no, I think go to display setting. What kind of car is that? And then duplicate slide. Okay. My apologies, Madam That's Chair. That's okay. Uh, okay, go going on again, uh, PILT does date back to 1979 uh, with first payment occurring in 1980. Uh, in compensates for direct and indirect costs are relating to state-owned natural resources land. All 87 counties receive monies under the program with some of those shared with uh, townships and school districts. Although it's a significant element of the state's environmental policy, uh, jurisdiction for this program has always been with the tax committee. In fact, I date back to 1979 when I was on staff of the committee when this program was first uh, enacted. It's grown substantially since its 1979 inception. It started out at about $5,512,000. Uh, for 2022, 
uh, the payments was $36,488,000, a 562% increase. However, that uh, monies and the increases that have occurred have not been shared uh, equally among the counties affected. As the Senator indicated, uh, the vast bulk of uh, the eligible lands are located in northern Minnesota. Uh, some counties have as much as 50% or more of their acreage captured in this program. Um, again, as indicated, uh, despite that concentration, the bulk of the increases in the program have occurred in southern Minnesota uh, for reasons that I'll go into shortly. Uh, the reasons are, one, uh, the differences under the current formula uh, de depends on the type of uh, land uh, located in the county and two, the valuation of one of those categories of land. Starting with the highest compensated uh, category of land, that's acquired natural resources land uh, under the statute, which is property uh, managed, administered by the DNR, uh, that was acquired generally by purchase, condemnation, or gift. Uh, the DNR administered other natural resources land uh, as the second highest uh, compensated category, um, and that's other property administered by the DNR. Uh, school trust fund lands is a major example of this category. The final category, county administered other natural resources land are generally tax forfeited lands outside of uh, cities that are administered by the counties on behalf of the, on behalf of the state. Uh, the reasons why uh, the um, increases and in where they've occurred are basically due to the formula that's uh, identified on this page. Acquired natural resources land um, started out at $3 per acre. It's now the higher of $5.13.3 per acre, or for most counties, three quarters of 1% of appraised value. It's whichever is higher. The county administered other natural resources land started out at 75 cents per acre. It's now at $2 per acre. Uh, the DNR or commissioner administered other natural resources land started out at a very low 37 and a half cents per acre. It's now also at $2 per acre. Uh, in terms of uh, where the changes have occurred, Again, want to emphasize it's the acquired natural resources land that have received the bulk of the increases, despite being the smallest category in geography of the three major categories, about one and a half million acres. Um, so um, they've received an increase of 19 million uh, 579,000, or about 1,100 percent between 1980 and 2021. The county administered land has received an increase of about $3,470,000, uh, an increase of uh, 65%, um, and um, they're about 2.5 or 2.7 million acres. And then the DNR administered other natural resources land have received an increase of 6432000 um, about a 266% increase. They're the largest category at over 4,098,000 acres. Okay. Um, because of inequities in the formula, we don't believe the statutory purposes uh, are currently been, being met. Uh, as the Senator indicated, in part is to compensate for loss of tax base and the need to provide services for these lands. Secondly, to address the disproportionate impact of state land ownership on those uh, local units of the government with a large proportion of state land within them. And finally, to address the need to manage these tax forfeited acreages outside, um, outside of cities. The failure to meet the statutory purposes along with growing disparities in the amount of PILT received per eligible acre raises a fundamental question of the fairness of the existing formula. Uh, as you can see, in terms of the average uh, compensation per acre under the formula, it ranges from $5 in the vast bulk of northern Minnesota to over $100 per acre uh, in some of the metro counties. I'm sorry.
The three quarters of 1% of appraised value option has been the primary driver uh, in these changes. Um, again, across the, they both basically the northern bounty, um, boundary of Minnesota, they've seen little change. Uh, their amount of compensation has gone from uh, $3 or less per acre to currently $5.13.3 per acre. Uh, some counties have seen increases of more than 10,000% during this period. Um, it used to not be that way. Uh, up until 1996, the difference between the highest and the lowest camp compensated county was a factor of eight. Now it's more than 170 times. The highest compensated county on a per acre basis receives more than 170 times what the lowest compensated county receives. Um, so this raises a question uh, that we looked at in the study, you know, is pilt keeping, keeping pace with inflation? Well, again, it depends on the types of uh, pilt eligible lands within the county. If it's acquired natural resources land for many of the counties, it's more than kept up with inflation. On average, based on this three quarters of 1% payment option, uh, counties are receiving $22.17 per acre far greater than what the rate of inflation would have been. Um, but for the county administered uh, other natural resources land, um, if it had kept pace with inflation um, through 2020, they should have been receiving $3.23 per acre. They're only receiving two. Uh, DNR administered other natural resources land, again, which started out at a very low 37 and a half. Inflation would suggest that be at $1.62. They are at $2, but again, they started out from a very low base. So just a couple uh, remaining things we looked at in the study. First, you know, is the formula um, meeting the statutory re requirement to uh, compensate counties for the loss of tax base? And we found for many counties, in fact, they are not. Um, this slide shows the 10 uh, lowest counties in terms of how much PILT they're receiving relative to what they would have received if PILT was on the tax base and subject to the current tax raise. And you'll see that St. Louis County uh, leads with a shortfall of 4.6 million. Uh, the 10th uh, lowest compensated or sh biggest shortfall is Hubbard County. When you go into the next 10 lowest uh, uncompensated counties, you do start getting into some of the southern counties, including Lacapara. Uh, Winona and Stearns counties. Excuse me, Mr. Carlson. Um, Senator Weber, did you want to ask your question now? I, I would. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I wanted to talk a little bit. You were going over, you know, the rate of increase, for example, in some of the agricultural areas being greater than the rate of inflation. But I think, Madam Chair, one of the things we need to remember there is that how PILT is computed is a computation of a percentage of value. And so we have seen ag land values increase at a much greater rate than the rate of even of inflation. And so as a result, you start to see a greater payment made uh, for those particular acres. And, and quite frankly, I hear from my counties that they're frustrated with the PILT payment because it's still much less than what the value is of, for ag land taxes. And so I, I, there's a distinction that needs to be made. The, the rate of inflation, I understand what you're saying, Mr. Carlson, but the rate of inflation is a totally different factor than what the market value is doing in terms of property values right now. And, and so, and that's how the PILT uh, payments are determined at the end of the day. And, um, and then uh, I have other comments, questions later, but I just wanted to point that out to people. Yeah, uh, Senator uh, Housechild, um, a response? Yeah, Ma Madam Chair and Senator Weber, thank you for that. I, I think that's good insight on sort of the difference between agriculture land and other lands. I would just add, um, it's important to note that many of these northern counties, their public land is much different also than agriculture land in the sense that it's in essence, by its definition, not meant to be developed. Uh, it, it, we want it to be pristine. Uh, we want it to be there for recreation, for uh, public use, and to to sort of maintain the beauty of of northern Minnesota. So it's a 
It, you're absolutely right that in terms of valuations, agricultural land is, is different and should be compensated. However, I would also argue there's sort of a different value base for some of these northern public lands that is much different than developable agricultural land. So that would just be my, my response. Thank you. Madam Chair, if I could just make one of course, for further Mr. observation. Carlson. The market value adjustment, I'll acknowledge um, the Senator's observation that the increase is due to market value increases, not inflation. That only applies to acquired natural resources land. Um, that adjustment is made every six years and will in fact be occurring in 2023 after last occurring in 2027. Uh, for the other major categories, the bulk of the acreage, the county administered other natural resources land, and the DNR or commissioner administered other natural resources land, they receive no increase. They're frozen regardless of their market value. So, well, uh, there'll be roughly a $4 million increase in PILT in 2023 for the market value increases for these acquired acres. The other two, which are the bulk of the acreage, receives nothing. They stay frozen at $2 per acre. Okay, Madam Chair, uh, then this Mr. last Carlson. slide goes through the changes that were proposed in uh, the uh, bill, uh, Senator File uh, 697. Um, I will not belabor them other than to point, point out the uh, additional compensation for those counties with large uh, acreages of state-owned natural resources land in part provides some compensation for the fact that they host 92% uh, of the school trust fund lands that provide $40 million a year to school districts throughout the state. Um, finally, um, the formulas uh, increase, I've shown it graphically on this slide. Obviously, much of it goes to northern Minnesota, but there are some southern Minnesota counties. Uh, no county receives a reduction. In fact, 85 counties receive an increase, although those, though those shown in white it's nominal because they do not have uh, significant county or DNR administered other natural resources land. With that, I'll uh, conclude. Be happy to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Mr. Carlson, Senator Hellis Child. Um, comments, discussion on uh, Senate File 697, Senator, no Senator Weber. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, <clears throat> I understand, Madam Chair and, and Senator Hellis Child, the, the purpose of having an inflationary factor in there. Um, I, I guess I, I just want to caution us. I, I get very nervous about including inflation, automatic inflators in our, in our budgets, in our numbers. Um, we have had historic surpluses. We have a historic surplus. Uh, and yet history has shown us that those surpluses will not always be there. And, and uh, um, and it, sometimes what happens if we have these inflationary f uh, inflators in, automatically built into our budget, it's very easy for legislators to get lazy, to be honest with you, to look at what exactly our costs are of providing services and what have you. And, and then all of a sudden when we have a budget shortfall, bingo, we go back and, and, and cuts are made that truly hurt. And, and, um, and I, I, I do not question that our northern counties need an adjustment in their pelt payments uh, and, and that type of thing. I, I just, I do worry about inflators uh, mm -hmm. being included, but thank you. Uh, Senator Weber, I think that's a, a good caution on any number of um, ideas and proposals that come, come before us. There are other uh, testifiers that I would like to call up at this point then. Um, Mr. Um, Paul McDonald um, and Mr. Mac, uh, Matt Hilgard, and then finally um, Mr. Matt Mosman. We'll start with Mr. McDonald. Welcome to the um, committee, uh, Mr. McDonald. Um, we welcome your, your um, and I should have called you commissioner, I apologize. Um, we welcome your testimony. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair, members. Uh, appreciate the opportunity. Again, my name is Paul McDonald. Uh, I reside in Ely. 
I represent the northern half of St. Louis County. Uh, my district is larger than the state of Rhode Island. And, uh, you know, I just want, I would just want to talk about the importance of this bill to the taxpayers of uh, northern St. Louis County, and especially in my district. Because uh, as we look at, you know, over 60% of the land in my district is held in public trust, which means it's available for people throughout the state of Minnesota, throughout our beautiful country to come up north and recreate. And we don't have the opportunity in, a, in an area rich in natural resources to open these lands for development. And thus, uh, we don't have any income taxes coming from these, from these uh, lands, which is you know, the reality of a rural economy. Uh, like I said, over half the land in my district is not eligible for development paying any property taxes, many local communities struggle, and many local governments struggle to provide the basic services that we so uh, well need. And uh, again, it's just, we talked about, uh, you know, when Mr. Carlson was talking about fairness, I, I think, uh, you know, we shouldn't expect any county to have to bear a disproportionate share of, uh, of the burden. You know, I, we testifiers have talked about the spirit of Pilt in 1979, what happened, uh, the changes that uh, occurred in the mid-90s. And I think this bill here, fortunately, is a major reform for the, for the Pilt program that will re reduce that unfair disparity uh, while holding others as... Mr. Carlson stated, holding others harmless. Uh, and this, this bill restores Pilt's uh, statutory purpose, and I will read it, and it says that uh, the purpose of Pilt is to address the disproportionate impact of state land ownership on counties with a large proportion of state land and to compensate them for this lost tax base. And again, I, I really appreciate the time, uh, Madam Chair and committee members. And this is a very important issue for northern counties and will provide significant property tax relief for Minnesotans. So I appreciate that. Thank, thank you very much, um, Commissioner. We'll now hear from um, Matt Hilgart. Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for the time today. My name is Matt Hilgart. I work for the Association of Minnesota Counties. AMC represents all of Minnesota's 87 counties. And if, if you will, Madam Chair, I'll just put a couple exclamation marks next to points uh, already made. And that is that this program is critically important. And even though, uh, as this, the bill authors mentioned, that this bill mostly uh, relates to several counties in the north, this is an association of Minnesota County, counties' priorities of all 87 counties because we recognize just how critical PILT is to delivering the services and commitments we've made to our residents across the state. It's not just about property tax base, uh, property tax replacement. It is not just about recognizing the need of services on these lands, but as a, a Representative Housechild said, this is about recognizing the fact that these lands will never be able to be developed. And in that sense, it's not just an important commitment that the state has made. It, uh, it also is a symbolic promise and hope that conservation and community solvency can go hand in hand, that those two things don't have to battle each other. And in this state, we hold conservation dear, and I think that, that is, part of that is success is because of the strong commitment, historical commitment, we've had to programs like PILT. So with that, the Association of Minnesota Counties uh, is a strong supporter of this bill, and we thank the author uh, for his efforts. Thank you, Mr. Hilgard. Uh, Mr. Mosman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm Matt Mossman with the Minnesota Inter-County Association. MICA represents 15 of Minnesota's larger and faster growing counties, and that includes, um, for our membership, St. Louis County. We echo the policy points of previous testifiers, and so I'll just add emphasis as well in a couple of places. Um, all counties receive PILT. And uh, the reason that we have long supported this legislation is that while acquired lands, that tend to be um, in many of the other counties um, ha do receive adjustments and the PILT program has worked at least better to Senator uh, Weber's point, but well in that it 
uh, it, those property values are appraised and PILT payments do rise over time as the cost of delivering services to those properties rise. That has not been the case um, for these other natural resource lands uh, that are heavily concentrated in St. Louis County and other counties. So um, these uh, lands do uh, require local public services like emergency, medical, fire, law enforcement, solid waste, and on. And those uh, costs have risen over time while these uh, per acre payments have remained flat. So we believe that for this program to continue working well, um, to make sure the lands and the resources are available uh, for Minnesotans, that it's important that we adjust these uh, rates as well uh, to make sure that they reflect the rising costs of delivering services. And so we strongly support this legislation as well. And thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mosman. Is there any uh, further comment from members of the committee? Then uh, um, Senator Housechild, uh, if you want to um, make some final comments. Thank you, Chair Rest and members of the committee. Again, I think the, the most important aspect of this bill is to go back to the original statutory reason for PILT payments. Um, we've seen this not keep up with inflation, um, and we've seen an inequity uh, when it comes to um, acquired land versus the existing land uh, that, that our counties hold. So I'm hopeful that uh, we will lay this over to for inclusion in the omnibus. Um, I think one of the big things that I'm focused on uh, that this bill indirectly supports is reducing our property tax burden. Um, and we see in these northern counties and in my district and many others, uh, increased property taxes and burden on our local residents to maintain state land that we all enjoy, that, that everyone uh, wants to hold sacred. And so I'm hopeful that um, we will see these reforms made. And I thank you all for hearing my testimony. Uh, thank you, Mr. Uh, I mean, Senator um, Housechild. Uh, <clears throat> uh, Senate File 697 will be laid will be laid over for um, consideration in the omnibus bill. Um, I think it's important for us, by the way, as we hear these bills, to start adding up our wants and, um, uh, and the impact of these bills on the, on the state budget. And I think today's gets us up to like $25, $30 million. So um, every day it looks like we're, gonna have, we're going to have uh, um, uh, good proposals that, that nevertheless are going to bring tax relief to um, Minnesota citizens. So thank you very much, uh, Senator Housechild. I will remind the people in the audience that we do not allow beverages or, beverage or containers with beverages um, in them in this hearing room. Um, the person that violated that this morning left the room before I could make this announcement, but I hope I hope his colleagues will uh, let him know that he may not bring a beverage container in the, in the hearing room. Uh, tomorrow we have um, uh, some um, additional bills. Mr. Berggren? Yes, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we're going to take up uh, two, possibly three, construction material uh, exemptions again, uh, like Senator Hothschild's last week. Uh, there's a potential that one may drop off. We're not certain yet. Okay. Um, there being no further business before the committee, we're adjourned.